Welcome to Greenhouse Grower to Grower, the podcast where we talk to growers from across the greenhouse industry about market trends, innovation, their biggest challenges and opportunities, and more. I'm Brian Sparks, editor of Greenhouse Grower. Last week's episode of Greenhouse Grower to Grower was part one of my conversation with Tom Costamagna of Young's Plant Farm, Greenhouse Grower's 2024 Head Grower of the Year. Please check it out if you have not already. In this episode, I continue my conversation with Tom, where we talk about the tools he uses to solve problems in the greenhouse, how he works with the ownership and growing teams at Young's Plant Farm, and more. Please enjoy the rest of our conversation. Do you want to get into to some of the other tools that, that you were talking about, too, and, and specifically when you, fo- when you focus on, you know, diagnosing problems and monitoring problems in the greenhouse? And I know there were, there were a few different things that we had talked about. Can you kind of go through, you know, s- some of these n- new tools that, that, that you've started to work with and how they might work? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I keep putting pressure on ball because the ball helix lab is amazing. Um, but years ago, um, I stumbled across, across this uh, diagnostics from University of Guelph that does a DNA multi-scan. Mm-hmm. And so even though we can't technically send plant tissue across borders because of uh, the quarantine 37 laws, you're able to put it into a smoothie and submit it as a water sample. But what it has been able to do that U.S. lab, traditional U.S. labs have not been able to do to date is I can take a sample on a Monday, overnight it to University of Guelph, which is in Ontario, Canada, and they run it through this multi-DNA scan. And they can tell me typically by Thursday afternoon or by Friday the latest what organism or organism and the magnitude of the organism present in soil and water, and and I also say tissue because literally I take a food ninja, I take the tissue and make it an aqueous solution and run it through uh, a strainer and submit it. And, you know, nowadays or historically, you know, the the best, the best university labs, I, I I don't care if it's my alma mater, if it's University of Florida, Michigan State, you know, they would have to go through this long uh, process of plating organisms, isolating them, and it typically took weeks. And then at the end of the day, it wasn't down to the species level. Yeah. And so that was, you know, would also, you know, hinder what your choices were on chemical applications and, and so forth. So that's been a novel tool um, that I think I've been using now 2016 2017 so you know okay. i try to pass that bit of information to anybody that's running into that type of problem yeah and, you know it's not that u.s labs can't do it the 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 machinery is not inexpensive right um but it's a vital tool another tool that that i that i stumbled across uh, again you know you can be the best grower but you're going to have problems uh one time or another uh right inadvertently or whatnot is and rescue laboratories so they do a multi-residue analysis you know they basically they call it looking in quetchers and basically what they're able to do is basically run several hundred compounds you know new and old chemistries and actually tell you the presence you know whether it's parts per billion parts per trillion parts per million and you can get an, a better idea of what might have caused phytotoxicity you know this is after running a soil test after running a tissue test you know at the end of the day what did i apply you know it it could be a new chemistry it could have been a tank mix of chemistry and so this type of residue testing has been in the food industry for 40 years um i think it, it it got elevated during this whole movement of you know hemp and cannabis you know whether it was recreational or you know for medicine in in the recent years um, it's not inexpensive, but at the end of the day, you know, we had a problem, um, with platycotton, um, we were getting some, uh, necrosis and so we'd clean it and then we'd spray it. And then the problem got worse. And we could figure, we thought we were dealing with a, a particular pathogen and come to find out after we ran it through Anresco, um, platycotton was very, uh, susceptible or not, was very toxic uh, mural, which is a 7-Eleven, you know, it's got a palacrostrobin and, 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 uh, or a strobilurin in there. And basically this testing showed us how the levels were astronomical, even with a, a regular spray compared to plants that, 
you know, hadn't had been sprayed yet. And then you get the, the aha moment. You're like, stop spraying mural. And lo and behold, the problem goes away. And so um, that's been a, been, been a, 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 a phenomenal tool, you know, again, expensive that doesn't have the turnaround that the university of guelph does but at that point when you're running that test you've you you've exhausted your resources and you just want a closure to to what happened oh yeah and then you know the other one that um has been instrumental you know we all have greenhouse controllers you know with i call them bird feeders because that's what a lot of people think those little boxes are <laughs> bird feeders but you know they have the aspirated box with your wet bulb dry bulb humidity and whatnot, but Apogee is a company uh, that makes scientific instrumentation. It's actually owned by Dr. Bruce Bugsby from Utah State. And mm -hmm. for folks that don't know him, he's Mr. NASA. I mean, he's doing he's been doing research for NASA for more than twenty years. Um, he's a, a heck of a, heck of a researcher. But he produced an item that benefits growers small and large. So you know, our go-to weather st station historically would be a watchdog but it had limitations. Um, he built a, the, this guardian that not only does it do light temperature, humidity, vapor, deficit, vapor pressure deficits, also doing CO2, uh, barometric pressure and DLI. But what's most important to me is um, that we've learned was the photo, photo period aspect. You know, everyone yeah. has ideas how long their photo periods are, um, you know, related to the time of year, but, you know, the impact of, uh, you know, whether it's five days or 10 days of cloudy weather or what we learned um, in the perennial side, you know, a lot of us will, you know, trigger flower initiation in perennials, not necessarily by long days, but night interruption. And, you know, it's a stronger, abrupt uh, induction of flowers. And we trialed, you know, historically would be a two night interruption, a two hour night interruption. Um, and we went ahead and did a four hour night interruption, even a six hour night interruption. And what we learned is with a six hour night interruption that the plants were perceiving a 16 hour day under short days, which is huge. So does that plant really need it? But it just gives you the peace of mind that, you know, a 16 hour a plant perceiving a 16 hour day is a lot stronger flower induction than 12 or 13. And so with this instrumentation, we had no idea until we, until we put them out there. Um, we're also using them in different structures, you know, a Cravo greenhouse that has single hung or double hung echoes or a Cravo house that has no echoes or field situations that's, you know, lower in the field uh, versus outside at another field. Um, and it's interesting, you know, you one would presume all greenhouses are created, but, you know, in an MX greenhouses with the rack and pinions with or without, you um, echoes um and being glass our poly houses that are now probably 40 years old have a higher light transmission and it's not because of the plastic versus the glass it's the heat pipe it's the trusses it's all the other greenhouse infrastructure so you know now you know certain parts of the year we have the data to make better decisions of you know what crops require higher light what crops can handle say less optimum condition. And we didn't have that information, uh, you know, a year ago. And, yeah. uh, you know, this, this, we saw Royal Hines actually got the prototype in 2017 when I was at American color, when we were having a, a meeting on wood and fusarium of all, all things. And Bruce Bugsby was there, you know, looking at phenolic compounds and he wanted to show everybody his new toy. And so <laughs> we finally got the official release it's about it's going on about eight or nine or ten months so it's pretty dang new but the other exciting thing is is going back to the bird feeders this apogee guardian can work on bluetooth or modbus and modbus means that you can actually replace and wire these directly into your greenhouse controller so mm -hmm. you know you historically had to buy an upgrade or an external light core sensor sensor to read radiation and all this or you know or co2 analyzer you know this this is literally in the size of a small coffee mug um and it has all that um being recorded which is yeah. so l let's take a step back um 
I mean, that, that was such great information on, on how you guys are using, you know, new and emerging tools to the best of your ability. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about you, know, the team that's in place at Young's Plan and, and how you work with them from a couple of different angles. And it'd be, first of all, you know, the ownership team, the Young family at Young's Plants and how you work with them on, you know, deciding on, on new steps in the company, projects, innovations, investments, things like that. And then on the other side, you know, how you work with your growing team to, you know, help them develop and become more experienced on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you talk about each of those? Yeah, so from an ownership side, um, they're the old school farmer. So, you know, they're, they're in the greenhouse, they're breathing the greenhouse, um, you know, is basically ingrained for, with, you know, into them, you know, when Gene Young started this company. So those conversations are often frequent and, you know, they're not, it's not like they're, they're very formal in the sense of, uh, you know, send me an email and we'll talk about it. You know, you know, we, we, we have a vision where we want to take the company, um, and, uh, you know, the thing is, is, you know, gr growers always have the, I need now, I would like to have, and, you know, you, 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 you always, I won't say you push the envelope, but you always challenge our uh, ownership and ownership always challenges the growing team. Well, we've done it this way without any problems. Why, why do we <laughs> need to make that investment? Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's great because, you know, I'm helping Young's, but I, I didn't bring Young's to where it is. I'm trying to take them from today to tomorrow. They they built this company on sound, you know, business um, theology or however you want to call it, um, how how they how they envision growing. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you were to visit Young's, a lot of people step back and sometimes scratch their head because, you know, we've used wood for 20 years that came out of research at Auburn University. We actually, our primary nutrient source is much like a nursery. We're, we're 90, 90 plus percent controlled release fertilizer. We might use a trailer or, 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 or so uh, of CRF. And so, you know, they're open to the new technology, but it also needs to, to make sense. And so sure. you know, we have those conversations and sometimes some are fast, like when we did this expansion on the back, you know, we were recycling water, you know, we want to be stewards of the land. And so putting the infrastructure in to uh, not only treat water, but process water. So, you know, there is no chemical that's a shovel. So if you look at, at it from a municipality or anything else, you know, there's, there's steps in the process, you know, filtration, uh, uh, removal, you know, we all of our recycled water goes through activated carbon, you know, giant vessels. And, you know, that was that that was our standard. But I said, well, what are we doing? What are we doing with the water afterwards? And I challenged them that we should be aerating it and using ozone, which is a common practice in wastewater as well as drinking water reservoir. So mm -hmm. in that same cases, we're all on the same page. You know, your, your, your water is like your blood and your media is like your organs. If we don't get those two things right, it doesn't matter what genetics we we put in them. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a, it, it's a very uh, amicable relationship of these discussions. You know, we just recently upgraded our cutting cooler and our seed cooler. You know, part of it is the organic growth this company's had and the way we were doing it. You know, I wouldn't say we're taking shortcuts, but we kind of outgrew our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other things that, uh, you know, if I made a, a suggestion to change a certain drink, a certain style greenhouse structure, it's probably gonna be a longer conversation because we're, we're not, we're, we're not creatures of a habit in a bad way, but like our pump stations, you know, our pump stations typically have a 10 horse, two thirty horses and two fifty horsepowers. And it doesn't matter if it's in Alabama or in Andrews, North Carolina, we use the same pumps because then we have those pumps on the shelves and we're not stocking a bunch of miscellaneous parts. So, yeah. you know, when, you're, when, 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 when it's tried and true, you might get a little bit of, of uh, pushback. Mm -hmm. If it's something that we can all agree that will make us better and stronger, it typically gets uh, accelerated because, you know, we all, we all have that vision. We want to do what's right for our people, number one, and we want to do what's right for the plants. Uh, because at the end of the day, the people and the plants are, are are our business and our livelihood. Yeah. Well, and and on those people, you know, 
uh, just to go back to how you then work with your uh, the rest of your team and some of the steps that you take to help them become better growers themselves. Yeah. So I've always taken the the idea, you know, there's always, you know, you have all these different types of how people learn, visual, auditory, read, write, you know, um, active learning, so forth. But, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a veteran or if you're an owner or if you're somebody straight off the streets, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, unfortunately, I've been exposed, good, bad, and indifferent, challenges, rewards, or whatever. And really, you know, we use, you know, season season say get together like this is we're going into poinsettias this is the plan this is the problem you know what did we see last year down to you know hey i found this new technology or new chemical or whatever so it, I, mean, I, I almost look at it as like the japanese term of kaizen constant improvement and that constant improvement i try to drive through casual conversation classroom conversations anything and everything so you yeah. know if I don't know, I'll tell, I'll simply tell ownership or whoever I don't know, but my network of, uh, you know, in the industry, my network outside the industry, you know, it, it's just taking that information and disseminating it and just, you know, people don't have my background and I can't expect them to know what I know because Heck, I don't even remember everything I know. I, I rely on Evernote that has 20,000 files all related to growing. So sometimes <laughs> I find things from, you know, a decade ago that was novel and great. And I was like, well, I can apply here again. So yeah. really my team, you know, our, you know, it's not my team. It's our team is really this interaction of, you know, finding a problem in the greenhouse. And it could be something as simple as latex rupture on poinsettia. And they're like, should I be worried about this? Well, we should be worried about it because was it in cre created by the the environment or was it created by someone, you know, uh, brushing across the leaves? So, you know, I've always taken it as there is no dumb question and just like constantly me teaching them is constantly keeping me fresh mm. and knowledgeable, you know, in the subject matter. And that subject matter is this week, this season, this year, last year. And, you know, it's one of the things I've been privileged, you know, when I started at Mid-Am, Royal was a consultant. When I started at American Color, Royal was a consultant. When I started at Young's, Royal was a consultant and not Royal being a consultant here. I always asked him for all of the reports for those individual companies that I had just joined. Yeah. So I could, I could read the history of the problems or the challenges or the repeat problems and right. gives you a huge insight to the organization that you just joined. And so, you know, that way, you know, you can adapt where you've been, what you've learned for the particular needs of, at that company. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, here at Young's, I mean, you know, put it this way, no intention of ever leaving. And my wife said, if, if I ever considered another job, She's going to stay in Auburn. So, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you hear about Southern hospitality and Southern living, um, it's a great place not only to work for the youngs, but a, just a great community. You can get stuck talking to somebody in the grocery store for 45 minutes just because I'm wearing a young shirt. I'll hear, I'll hear the stories of, you know, Papa Gene all the way down to, the, you know, how Greg Young was a hell of a tailback in high school. So it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's it, and it's and it's it's those con those conversations where it's not always about learning or teaching them about plants. It's a, it's it's that it's that communication about community that we learn from another one from one another to make us better. Well, I'm glad you brought that up too. You know, kind of goes back to you know you had said before. You know, you you're in a lot of you know or, or remote areas for the places that you worked before, and you know I was I was in a, a panel discussion to cultivate a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was all about employee engagement. But one of the things they talked about was um, how you work not just through your employees, but with, but with your local community. And, you know, you might not be a, a grower that you're not selling within, you know, your local community, but you want to give them some awareness on who you are. So I think I appreciate the fact that, you know, you talked about you know, working locally and, 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 you know, informing people, not just about youngs, but I think too about, you know, there's just not a lot of overall familiarity with how, 
greenhouses operate and you know when somebody goes to to, to to buy their plants what's the whole process behind getting those plants to the store so that's really yeah. interesting yeah and i remember and i wish syngenta would re resurrect it so i mean this is going back uh, well no, technically it goes back to the goldsmith days and i remember the, the goldsmith family and i don't know if it was glenn or joel or a combination of them they had a video at the time that basically showed the process from seed or cutting, you know, through the whole process where it ends up, whether it's at a big box store or the garden center. And, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I, I don't know how you get a uh, discovery or some, you know, some, somebody who has impact because, you know, you always learn about say agronomic crops, field crops, or, you know, that type of stuff you see, you know, harvest, Oranges harvested in Florida, going through the process, whether it's juice or fresh market, where they get waxed and and put in yeah. bags, but you don't see that from the flower side. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely true. Um, let's look to the future here, here, um, and look at maybe what's what's next, both at Young's Plant Farm and just you know, when we look at, at a higher level. What are you most excited about when it comes to the future of this industry, N not just for Young Plants, but for the industry as a whole and where it's headed? Well, I think the excitement has it is you know it, it's also the, the the could be scary, but it's like the unknown. So, and the, and the unknown is you know where we talked a little bit on the say the technology side or the breeding side or you know really what is the greenhouse going to look like? Mm -hmm. You know because you know a lot of these companies you know you know started one way and built on built on. You don't see. Uh, new players, if you will, because, you know, at the end of the day, most of these live goods are not contract grown, you know, with, with, the, with the retailers, you know, it's, it's good faith or, uh, you know, gentleman's handshake you, if you will. And yeah. so we're always challenged. How do you become more efficient while still being profitable? So, you know, you know, whether it'd be going down the road here in Alabama to Kia and seeing how they manufacture cars, you know, the most exciting thing is how do we take the new breeding technology, but how do we develop, you know, how do we produce plants? You know, are we going to be producing them in a bubble, if you will? You know, there's a type of greenhouse called Kubo greenhouses where, you know, it's positive pressure and it's not grown in flowers. But I think, you know, as Dr. Armitage, we are essential. And, you know, how do we maintain being essential? You know, the, the great thing is, is, you know, we've been challenged by box stores, you know, how do you improve your carbon footprint? Well, we'll grow more plants, <laughs> you, you know? And so, you know, the, the, the future, you know, I almost think we're at like that Jetson moment where, or back to the future where we, where we, where it's the, the sky, you don't know what it's going to look like because things that were not possible are possible. You know, the, you know, you have the, you have the, 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 the technology of CRISPR, which is, you know, controversial in food commodities, but I think it's going to revolutionize plant genetics because if we can take susceptibility out for certain genes or create plants that have better shelf life and all that kind of stuff, I think it's going to be a huge win-win you know, you know, for the industry. So, I mean, that's what excites me is, you know, where, where we came from, where we are today and what it, what is the possibilities of tomorrow? Oh, I love that. I love that approach. Um, you know, so, so the last question that, that I think I have is, you know, we've talked in depth about, you know, your role at Young's Plant, so, so, so some of the new technologies you're trying, how you work with your team. It's not always about being in the greenhouse though. So I would like to find out when, uh, when you're not walking through the greenhouse, where you're not in the offices of Young's Plant Farm, what do you like to do on a personal level? All right. Well, um, I'm, I have Italian descent and with Italians, there's a couple things uh, Italians like to do. That's one, they like their wines, but more enjoying wine is with a good meal. So mm. um I've been blessed to have parents that love to cook and um, I have been blessed to be able to say cook that's edible, if you will. And so a lot of times, whether it's neighbors or where it's friends, it's, you know, you know, having a cookout, it could be simple as hamburgers and hot dogs, or it could be as exotic as oxtails or, 
lamb shanks is uh, uh, if you will but uh thoroughly enjoying a good meal whether it's prepared by me or prepared by others or even at a fine establishment because you know it's 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 that time away from uh work to relax um you know just just as dr armitage says plants are essential well food's essential to good health so i definitely enjoy that um the other thing that I thoroughly enjoy, my father, even though he's of Italian descent, he was born and raised in Argentina. Mm. So uh, I played soccer as a kid. I played basketball as a kid. But today I watch much more soccer uh, than I do basketball. And with the, the the recent winning streak of Argentina and the Copa America, uh, yeah. winning the UEFA Cup and then the World Cup, uh, it's been very, very fantastic to be a Argentine soccer fan, let alone soccer developing uh, here in the U.S. with, you know, Messi coming to, uh, you know, Miami and all the European players where historically when they retired e either from La Liga or, or the Premier League, they were re retired because they were just a little slower than the young the young folks, but now they can extend their career and play in the MLS. So it's been really great to watch soccer grow globally, let alone in the U.S. Um, but last not but least, I mean, one of the things I wish I had more time um, and hopefully, you know, when that day of retirement, I was hoping being three hours or so from the coast, I really love deep sea fishing. So <laughs> Um, uh, you know, I have memorable trips, um, with my former, uh, boss, Dr. Perella and colleagues. We used to go down to the Sea of Cortez, uh, go on a seven day fishing trip. And it's a part of, uh, of the Sea of Cortez known as the Midriff Islands. And a lot of people aren't familiar with it, but it's 250 miles South out of San Felipe, but it has some of the best deep sea fishing from yellowtail grouper, sea bass, snapper, uh -huh. uh dorado dolphin pin you name it i mean it's like and, and and the thing is is you're you're committed but on top of it it's underdeveloped so you have if you're if you're a plant person like me i mean you have cacti forests coming down the slopes of the hills all the way up to the ocean and down there they don't have coral they got volcanic rock and mm -hmm. so you know you're using large line to catch large fish uh, but one of the most spectacular things, um, you know, you have you have the whale migration, of course, but you have the giant Humboldt squid that migrate migrate from the, the Pacific Ocean and, you know, outside Humboldt and Trinity County that come to the Sea of Cortez to breed. And, you know, most people would think of them as octopuses, I mean, these giant Humboldt squid and their right. beaks are the size of parrots. But when you see when you're catching them for bait or to eat them. The waters are pulsating like sci-fi and oh, wow. you know, we're using 80 pound test and they're shooting ink. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's moments that I've been able to share with my wife, my father, and hopefully can take my, my boys now that they're getting older, um, to experience. Well, it's funny you, you talk about your cooking, your cooking skills, and that's pretty much convinced me to make sure that I get my trip down to Young's Plant Farm here in the near future. Not, I mean, I got to check out the facility, obviously, yeah. but I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm as much down for a, a great meal as anybody. So, <laughs> all right, well, you're, you're welcome to come, and love to cook for you. Thanks for joining us. You can learn more at greenhousegrower.com. Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen, and please leave us a rating as it helps other podcast listeners find the show.